I suppose we should probably get started. Um, so Ryan uh, agreed to come up and give a nice uh, higher level talk. Uh, so I warned that this is gonna, gonna be, there's probably gonna be a little bit of a discontinuity between the, uh, the first talk and this one. Um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe this will show a little bit of how, how deep the rabbit hole goes, uh, perhaps. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name is Ryan. Uh, I'll be talking about joint work with uh, David Spivak, who's back there in the corner. Uh, and I'll be talking about a functorial query language, uh, which is a little query language we've been developing over uh, at MIT. So in, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about this language that we call MQL. Um, it's a query language that's based on category theory, so hopefully uh, the functional programmers in this audience uh, can appreciate it. I'm going to try to. Can you not hear me back there? Not loud. Okay. This, how's that? Any better? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to avoid using category theory in this talk, though, uh, to make it more accessible. And then in the second half of the talk, uh, I'm going to attempt to demonstrate that if you know how to program using Haskell, uh, you also know how to program using FQL. And whereas you may have seen query languages embed into Haskell, things like link, for example, uh, FQL actually provides an alternative semantics uh, to Haskell. So it'll look a little bit different probably than anything you've seen before. And then uh, everything that I'm talking about tonight has been implemented uh, in actual code, uh, Java code, but you can Go to this link uh, and download it and play with it. So, um, what is FQL? Well, uh, FQL it's a it's a query language for relational databases uh, of a special kind. So here on the screen, uh, I have written essentially an entity relation relationship diagram. This is a special kind of relational database schema. You have some entities, in this case, employees and departments. These are little black dots. Uh, you have attributes associated with these entities, so an employee has a first and a last name, and a department has a name. And then you have foreign key relationships between the employees and the department. So an employee can have a manager, an employee uh, works in a department, and a department has a secretary. And then here at the bottom, I've written some equations between paths in this schema uh, that essentially that says, for example, that um, the empl an employee's manager must work in the same department that the employee does. Um, uh, right. So here at the bottom, I've written an instance on this database schema, and hopefully this is sort of intuitive. You have uh, three IDs, each or three employees. Each one has an ID, so 101, 102, 103. Um, they have first and last names here, Al Aiken, Bob Bo, Carl Cork. You have two departments, CS and Math. And then you have, uh, for the foreign keys, you have maps from employees to uh, departments and vice versa. So hopefully this is the kind of thing that most professional software developers have encountered in practice. Any questions so far on the meaning of this? Okay. Uh, so. So an employee works in a department. Oh, okay. And what deal is works in the IT department? Right. The path and yeah. <coughs> oh, so the works column, that's a foreign key? Uh, yes, so works, ah. secretary, and manager are foreign keys, and first, last, and name are attributes. And so here I basically just <coughs> set up uh, in a text using relational terminology. You have Entity sets, foreign keys, attributes, and uh, data integrity constraints. So uh, this language we developed called FQL is essentially a database at a time language for manipulating the kinds of instances uh, that I just showed you. And now there are, there are other languages that allow you to manipulate database instances, uh, like I just showed you, for example, SQL. Um, but we're, we believe that because of the, the roots of FQL and category theory, and I'll go into this next, that FQL is actually a better language for manipulating databases uh, than SQL is. 
And here are a few reasons why this SQL language, you transform whole databases to whole databases, not just one table at a time. And in this language FQL, you're only, you can only write queries that respect the constraints of your database tables. And then uh, there are some other theoretical properties that FQL has uh, that SQL does not. And then there's a formal connection between FQL and SQL as well. We have some papers on the website you can read. Um, I won't argue too much about why FQL is better than SQL. I'm just going to define what FQL is and then show you how to program it using Haskell. So, uh, how does this work? Well, suppose I have two schemas, S and T, so those are the ER diagrams that I showed you before. I'm going to define something called a schema mapping between them, let's call it F. So what I have to give you is a mapping from the nodes of S to the nodes of T, and from the edges of F, S to the paths in T. And this has to respect the constraints of your schema. Yes, question back there. So you refer to that ER diagram So here, for example, in terms of the compute power, not in terms of the fact that you would lose out the function. Yeah. So here, uh, they are a subset. For example, works in has to be a functional relation. It can't be an arbitrary relation. It has to be a function. Uh, you can't hang attributes off of uh, the foreign keys like you can in an ER diagram. Uh, those are the two big ones. Uh, also, in ER diagrams, you typically you, can, you have more granularity about how you can specify keys. So here, um, you know, emp is given by a set of IDs. I can't say that emp together with uh, first is a, is a key. It's just employees, a set of IDs. So this is a very special kind of ER diagram that has a nice semantics. Would you tell me that I can't write compound keys? Uh, No, th this is a, what I'm showing you here is uh, a particular subset of SQL DDL that our language FQL is going to manipulate. There are many SQL schemas that will not fall into this particular framework. Okay. But for instance, for instance, uh, so why do we run in GDL? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a lot of interesting theory that connects this to relational algebra um, that I can talk to you about afterwards. Right. Okay, so uh, I'm giving uh, FQL is oriented around the thing called a schema mapping, which is a map from one schema to another, given by a mapping of nodes to nodes and edges to paths. And for each schema mapping S to T, uh, FQL gives you three data migration operations. So one that we call delta, which takes instances on schema T to instances on schema S, which is kind of backwards. And then two that go forward, sigma and pi, which take instances on S, instances on T. And I'm going to uh, illustrate these with examples rather than uh, define them formally. So here is, uh, here are two tables. There are no foreign keys in this table. On the table on the left, you have two nodes, N1 and N2. You have three attributes, name and salary associated with N1, age with N2. And on the right, you have three attributes, name, salary, and age associated with N. If I map from N1 to N and from N2 to N, then I have a data migration operation that takes instances on N from the right-hand side and pulls them back instances on N1 and N2. Does a projection, essentially. This is one of the three key operations in FQL. I'll pause here for a moment. Questions about how this is working? What are S and T? Uh, so here, S is the schema on the left with the two nodes, and then T is the schema on the right with uh, the one node. So uh, this is S. And this is an instance on T, and it gets mapped back to an instance on S. I'm not quite sure I understand what happened. Are you just splitting that table? You just, or what, what separate projection would you be mapping that between two tables and the subset of the uh, yes, 
Yeah, th this will be a projection. It's okay. not an arbitrary split. It actually, um, you know, the, the way it's defined may have, using the category theory, it may not be immediately obvious it's a projection, but it is in fact a projection. Define what a projection is. Define what a projection is. Uh, so this is a projection in the sense of a uh, SQL, really, where you have a relational database table and you're just cutting off some of the columns. So in this case, you have three columns, and for N1, we're taking name and salary. So there's name, there's salary. And for N2, we're just cutting off page. Oh, okay. Yeah, is it simple split. Is a database view? A database view. Um, you, you could think of this delta operation as defining a view. It's interesting. The, the point to notice here is that your mapping F goes from S to T, but your view it, give, it goes the other way. Uh, sorry, other questions? Uh, sorry? No, not at all. Any any constraint respecting map. This is not a lens or anything like that. Sorry? Yeah, pretty easily too. <laughs> uh, composition. <laughs> uh, literally. Okay, uh, so here are the other ones. Yeah, so uh, we're going to use the same setup. So a mapping from S to T, just like as before. Here's the pi operation. Uh, in this case, it gives you the Cartesian product of these two tables. And the reason is that even though you have some IDs in common here between these two tables, the IDs are sort of meaningless. Your IDs could be one, two, three, and who are bads. There's no connection between an N1 and N2 with a foreign key, so the result of this pi operation is a Cartesian product that pairs each name and salary with the H. So three times three, nine rows here. And this one goes from S into T. Questions on this guy? Okay, and then there's a third operation uh, in MQL, um, well, sigma. That is, yes. So I'll just skip ahead to, if there were a foreign key like this, you would get the join along, uh, along those two tables. Um, right. But since there's not, might example, you might imagine how union works. So this third operation in MQL is called sigma, so there's a unity thing. And uh, it unions the tables together, but since N1 doesn't have an age column and M2 doesn't have names or salary, you get these unfortunate null values in your resulting data. But hopefully it's clear how these two things are union together um, to give you the result. Questions here? Okay, so just to give better intuition on how these, uh, these three operations work, suppose we add a foreign key from N1 to N2, here called little f, and uh, it's gonna, well, quite literally just map one to one, two to two, three to three, as such. What ends up happening is that both pi and sigma will compute the same result, they will take into account the fact that there is a foreign key between N1 and N2 and just naturally join the two tables together. So in this case, pi and sigma are both operating in the same way. And then the delta operation going from this way back uh, is not changed at all. Is that a proper inverse at that point? It might be a double in this case. So you, you, can, you can get inverses out of these things if you have special properties that are adjoints. So yeah, we have a left and right, or left and right adjoints for giving the same answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, literally, yeah. No, that's yeah. what's going on. Uh, so anyway, the, the higher level point here is that um, you know, I've shown you some simple database schemas and tables, but these operations extend to the case where you have lots of foreign keys and lots of path equality constraints. And uh, the same math that tells you what the answer is here also works for these arbitrary tables. And 
and these three primitive delta sigma phi uh, are the core of this language FQL that we've developed. Uh, so for the categorically inclined, let me just say that using math, uh, schemas are finitely presented categories, and schema mappings are just functors. Instances themselves are functors to set, and the schemas on any instance form a category, uh, and then and what we have are sigma and delta, it's a left adjoint pair and a delta and pi or right adjoint pair. Uh, and that's sort of the motivation for this language. Okay, so what I'd like to do in the second half of the talk is demonstrate that if you know how to program in Haskell, you actually already know how to program using this language FQL that I just described. And so when I say Haskell, what I actually mean is to simply type lambda calculus, which you can think of as being the, the core essence of Haskell. Um, I'm going to define it here formally as syntax. Um, so in the simply type lambda calculus, you have an empty type written 0, a unit type written 1. You have some types, which in Haskell will be written higher, product types, which Haskell are written as product types and then arrow types. And then expressions in the simply type lambda calculus look like this. An expression E is either a variable, it is a lambda abstraction of the type. You have function application, you have your unit, which gives you something of type 1. You have some operations on pairs, so you can take the first projection, the second projection, and or you can pair things up. You have this little operation bottom, which takes uh, an element of the empty type and turns anything. You can think of that like undefined if you want. You have your injections in left and in right, and you have something that looks like a case expression in Haskell. And the uh, intention here, or the definition of simply type lambda calculus, is that you have some equations on these pieces of syntax that says, for example, the first projection of a pair is literally the first projection of the pair. Or that when you apply uh, a lambda abstraction to an argument, the result is the body of the lambda expression with an argument substituted in. So let me pause here and ask if there are any questions <coughs> about simply typed lambda calculus. Uh, left versus right here. So in L versus in R. Uh, so those, I think, in Haskell, you have exactly the same Parameter in R. So, um, yeah, in, in L would take A to A plus B, and in R would take B to A plus B. So, capital left and capital right in Haskell. So, the constructors for either. Other questions? Okay. Uh, so, you can prove a theorem that says if you give me a type in the simply type lambda calculus, and I can give you back. FQL schema, and if you give me a term in the simply like type lambda calculus, so assuming that I give you a term E that has some free variables gamma and it has type T, and I can give you back a mapping between FQL schemas um, like this. So you would say that FQL schemas and mappings are a model of the simply type lambda calculus, or that um, FQL provides an alternative semantics to the simply typed lambda calculus. And so now I'm going to show how exactly this works. So let's we start by showing how to translate from types in the simply typed lambda calculus to schemas in FQL. So how do we do that? Well, uh, let's start with the empty type zero. So in Haskell, this is probably predefined. If you data empty equals something with no constructors. And that becomes an FQL schema with no node. If I give you uh, the unit type, so in Haskell, this would be just little parens, which we call right, data unit <coughs> equals something with one constructor. That would become an FQL schema with just one node. Question so far. Now I'm going to show you how to do sum and product types. So, uh, as I remarked earlier, sum types in Haskell are written as 
is either. So I'm going to add uh, a schema on the left to a schema on the right. Well, this is given by addition. I take the three nodes from the guy on the left, plug them in up here, mark them as coming from the left, and I take the two nodes on the right, add them in, mark them as coming from the right. And I've taken the two schemas on the left, and I've given you out a schema on the right. How do product type work? Product type works. Uh, well, I obtained a product of a schema with three nodes and a schema with two nodes. Then the resulting nodes are, you can think of them as pairs of nodes coming from the schema on the left. One node coming from the schema on the left, one node coming from the schema on the right. So there are six nodes here. And in this particular diagram, I haven't drawn any foreign keys or any path of quality constraints. But if you have those in your schema, then this construction um, extends straight forward. And <coughs> Questions on this? This is sort of how some of the product types work in Haskell in your straight up. OK. And then finally, um, function types are given by exponentiation. So you give me a schema with three nodes and a schema with two nodes. I'm going to create a function schema, if you will, uh, that's going to have two raised to the three nodes in it, each node is going to be a function from this schema to this schema. So for example, this node here says take A, map it to B, take B, map it to B, take C, and map it to B. And then there are eight possible ways to do this, so the result schema you get out has eight nodes in it. So that you can think of each node in this result schema is given by a function from this schema to this schema. So that means that the function associated with this node sends A to B and B to B and C to B. Likewise, this guy over here sends A to B, B to B, and C to B. And so since there are eight possible functions from the schema on the left to the schema on the right, there are eight nodes in the results schema here. Did that help at all? Sorry, I forgot who asked that question. It is, it's exactly a function table, right? And the point I have to realize here is that, um, you know, so in Haskell you might think of a function as given by like a lambda abstraction, but there are other types of function-like things you could have, such as database schemas, where you have a function schema, if you will. OK, uh, right. So uh, you can also throw in uh, you know, arbitrary database schema that we saw before. And these operations I just showed you, products on exponentiation, still work correctly. And so what I've just defined is a translation from simply type lambda calculus types to FQL schemas. Does anyone not believe me? Uh, OK, yeah. if, say, you have a, a foreign key here, is that you might end up with some foreign keys in this table. And it's possible that you may end up with less than eight nodes. Right. So and they'll they, just preserve them, but, okay. but nothing in the Lambda yeah. calculus yeah. will introduce them. Right. They, they're only introduced. Yes. Yeah, so you, if you were to. So I guess that's what I'm trying to get at here. So the, the counterpart to like a constant type would be someone who writes down the schema 
and then this works correctly with sorry Pri primitive yeah so the you can uh, you, zero one plus times exponentiation as this, this guy was mentioning, like that's not sufficient to say introduce foreign keys into your schema. But if you also allow arbitrary schemas to be used as part of this basis, then these operations, product sums, respect the foreign key structure. It's true, I'll show you. <laughs> you look skeptical. I'm finding a tight error. Um, okay, now I'm going to describe how, um, given a term in a simply typed language algorithm, you get out a mapping between schemas in FQL. Uh, and then it's these operations that are going to respect the equational theory of the simply typed language algorithm. So, what does this look like? Well, uh, in Haskell, you're given an element of the empty type. You can Create an element of an arbitrary type, which I've written here as bottom. In FQL, if you have a schema that is empty, you can construct a mapping from it to any other schema. So here is a mapping from the empty schema to uh, this primitive schema. Perhaps a, a, a more appropriate Haskell mapping for that would be there's like a there's a void package that we have to think about. Yeah, this is a really bad. Uh, we have, so we have a void package which provides empty. Yeah, so the, the absurd is the function in there that takes any void, uh, void to any type of. Yeah. So that would be the that would be the analog, analogous version of your problem. Yeah, yeah. A little perhaps, perhaps a little <laughs> more accurately than the undefined. Well, yeah, you well, don't really want to undefine. Uh, okay, um, what else do we have? Well, uh, in Haskell, you have this unit guy that creates elements of type one or a unit. Uh, so, what does that look like in FQL? Well, for any schema, such as this one, there is a unique map from it into uh, the unit schema that we described before. Namely, it just maps all of the nodes onto the one node, and it maps all of the paths onto the identity path of that one node. Uh, questions here? Yes, that's that's what this is. I wasn't sure whether or not to use TT or the every every programming language has a different name for it. Sometimes called star. Sometimes it's an exclamation point. But it, that's what this guy is. It's the uh, introduction form for the unit type. Okay. Um, so before I mentioned how to sum schemas and how to product them, but I'm also obligated to give you these operations that. Uh, in left and in right for forming sums, and I'm obligated to give you projections that project out in products. Uh, so how does that look like? Well, before I added this database schema with three nodes, and this one with two nodes, this get one with five nodes, and I need a function that maps for in left from this guy into here, so that's given by the green. You map A to in left A, B to in left B, and C to in left C. In right uh, is the orange, maps D to in right D and E to in right E. And then for the products, what I need are maps out of the product type. So um, here we have the, the product of a three node and a two node table over here. And I'm going to send each node to, in the case of the first projection, the left component, that's in red, or in the case of the second projection, uh, the second part of the pair, which is in blue. So now I have maps from the right into the left. Questions here? Great. So um, really, I'm, I'm obligated to show that all the operations of the simply type line of calculus can be translated into FQL. I just showed you a few. Uh, but for completeness sake, here are the other ones that you would need. Uh, you need the ability to form pairs. That's sort of a given in 
ask what you need the ability to do case statements. And then you need operations for function types. So there's one called curry that you need, and then there's another one called email that you need. And we can create FQL analogs of each of these, and we can prove they obey the required equations. And then you have a translation from the simply type language calculus types and terms, FQL schemas, and mappings, which means uh, essentially that you can translate from simply type language calculus into FQL. So you can program in Haskell, you can program in this little IDE that we built. You can program in Haskell without recursion. Without, without any of the fancy stuff. <laughs> without mixed yeah. points. Right. And no recursion, no polymorphism. I, I presume, you know, because you need you need the um, the strong presentation property that that you know fixed points and lists and oh. things like that are completely off the table. Yeah, you need, <laughs> because you of the need data and all that stuff to really be programming in Haskell. <laughs> programming against the LC. Right. Okay. Um, so some broader remarks here. Uh, what's going on is that uh, simply type lambda calculus types and terms, FQL schemas and mappings and even sets and functions between them are all instances of this thing called a bicartesian closed category. So at some point, people who are interested in Haskell will eventually run up against category theory. And I hope this convinces you a little bit that if you learn category theory to understand Haskell better, that you can also apply category theory in other places, uh, such as databases. And now, for my last trick, I'm going to show uh, that not only do FQL schemas and mappings form a model of simply type lambda calculus, I'm going to show further that if you fix any database schema, it's called an S, that the instances on that schema are themselves a model of the simply typed lambda calculus, uh, which essentially means that this language FQL we've developed is a, that contains two copies of the simply type lambda calculus inside of it. So these like Cartesian closed categories come up pretty much everywhere. All right, questions before the last little bit. Okay, so as before, this is a simply type lambda calculus, but I'm going to change what I'm going to give you. So um, if you give me a type in the simply type lambda calculus, I'm going to give you an S instance. So for the purposes of this part, we're gonna, this works for any schema, uh, I'm gonna show you this construction for just one particular schema. So you give me a type, I'm going to give you an instance on that schema. And then if you give me a term in the simply type lambda calculus, I'm going to give you a homomorphism between the databases. So what that means is it's going to be a map from the IDs of one instance to the IDs of another instance. Um, that homomorphism notion, I guess, ends up in relation to database theory, but maybe not so familiar. All right, so here's the schema that we're going to use for this last part. Uh, you have one node A, one node B, and a foreign key F in between them. So uh, what do you do? Well, let's start with the empty type. So as before in Haskell, this is a type with no constructors. I'm going to give you an instance on S that has no data. So that's what that looks like here. And then for the unit type, I'm going to give you an instance that has one row in every table, and the foreign keys are sort of filled in the only possible way that they can be. Questions so far? Okay. Sorry? Uh, that F is a, yeah, it's a, it's a functional, well, it's a foreign key, so yeah, it's a functional dependency. The edges in these schemas are always Functions, essentially. Okay. So now to make things a little more um, interesting, I'm going to show you how to add and multiply instances. But what I've done is we're going to add and multiply the same instance to itself. And I've said here that the foreign key in A both rows map into three. So this isn't just, this is a, uh, this is a instance with 
little twist in it, if you will. So you can see uh, in all of these that I've written down, four and keys both map <coughs> the same ID to B. But how did you get the number of the Oh, it actually doesn't matter what you put in this table. As long as it has one row, it's fine. So, um, so you have to, uh, it's true that there is no SQL operation that will just create from nothing uh, a database table with one value in it. So you have to, uh, when we implement FQL on SQL, for example, we have to use a special operation that says put this number one into our, our table. Um, but you can put 10, you can put A, you can put whatever you want as long as this table has exactly one. Row. Kind of like how in Haskell, if your unit type, it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is there's only one thing in your unit type. So there, there are a lot of instances that aren't SQL type because the SQL type aren't running as the only type or The answer is that uh, the instances are all considered up to isomorphism of the IDs. So if you had another instance that was ID2, F2, ID2, and from the point of view of FQL, those would be the same instance because the IDs are isomorphic. I, I think you're just looking for one plus one. Oh, one plus one. Yeah. To get two, to get two rows in the table. So if you use oh. one plus one, you get a value of one, a value of one, and then you change the name of it. Oh, okay, but the example is yeah. the value of the Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I just wanted to use an example here where the four keys were both going to the same rather than two different ones, because otherwise it looks kind of generic. Um, right, so some types are given by uh, disjoint union of instances. So here uh, we have one, two, and three and four are the IDs from the left table, A, B, C, and D are the IDs from the right. And you can see over here that we tagged the values within left or in right depending on their it came from, but the left table was these top two, and then the right table was uh, these bottom two, so the union. And then for producting, uh, you know, you might expect your entries here are pairs that came, pairs of things where the left tuple came from the left table, and the right part of the tuple came from the right table. And then the thing to notice in this example is. Um, for your foreign key, they're all the same here because in A, your foreign key, where it was all three in here, it was all C, so your foreign keys here are all three C, even though in your table B, you have four different things that have, could have matched to. Uh, right. Questions here? something that's available in the core calculus I described here, but you can always you can construct a mapping from the schema without the foreign key to the schema with the foreign key, and then you can use those delta sigma pi operations to move your data to and fro. Okay, and then I'll just mention that you have function tables uh, that correspond to the function types of the simple type learning calculus. So, uh, we have the same two tables as before, and we're going to construct a table that represents the functions from table on the left to table on the right. And this is a bit hard to read because there are lots of functions. So here what I mean is the mapping of the IDs from the left table to the IDs of the right table. So in this instance at the bottom, I've tried to write down exactly what that mapping is. So for example, uh, here we have homomorphism that says the ID1 from the left table maps to the IDA in the right table. So this entry up here literally says, oh, well, if you turn 1 into A, and 2 into B, 3 into C, and uh, let's see, 4 into D, then you have a valid transformation from the left table to the right table. So that's going to be an entry down here in your database. Uh, this one's a little hard. But in a 
a similar way to how the exponential construction on schemas looks, you have it's very much a function space kind of thing. I want to find all the ways to map one table from one database to another database, and each of those are going to show up as a row in my result. And I'm pretty sure there are eight ways to do this. And I calculated it using the tool that we were like. Questions here? Okay. Uh, then in that case, yeah, you wouldn't really want to do this in practice. And in fact, you can't do this operation in SQL. But uh, the math says it exists, so we threw it into our tool. Uh, yeah. Um, great. Okay, and then of course, um, you know, these operations, product sum exponentiation. They work with you know, arbitrary instances, not just the ones that are generated from zero and one and plus at times. So you give me a lambda calculus type, I give you an instance. Now I'm obligated to show you as well that for each lambda calculus term, I can give you a morphism of databases. So as before, uh, in Haskell, you have a way to, if you have element of the empty type giving you back an arbitrary element. So here is an arbitrary database on our schema, and here is the empty database that we had from zero. And you see that in fact there is one way to map the IDs on the left hand side and the IDs on the right hand side, because there are no IDs on the left hand side. Uh, dually, it has to you have a unit, and so what you have in MQL is if we have any database instance on S here on the left, but you have a map from its IDs to uh, the unit instance on the right. So you just take all the IDs and map them down uh, into one in this case. And then, as before, there's all these other operations that I have to show you that we can do, like injections, projections, and the like. This is uh, here the sum and product examples for adding this guy in green to this guy in orange. And the injections say, oh, map ID1 to ID in left 1. Map ID2 to in left 2. Map ID A in right A. And dually for products, I have to give you a map from these IDs to either here or here, depending on if you want first or second. So, First, for example, let's say, oh, map the ID 1 comma A to 1, and map the ID 1 comma B uh, to B. Sorry, say, uh, yeah. Anyway, projection maps. Questions here? Okay, so that's the end of the technical material. Uh, the point of this part is that this language FQL, the instances and uh, the, map, the morphisms between those instances are modeled as something like type lambda calculus. Uh, for the PL experts, in fact, they are more than that. FQL is a model of higher order logic. Sorry? Uh, this is plain intuitionistic higher order logic where you have a type called prop and uh, the equality between terms of arbitrary type into prop. Mathematics. No, pre predicate logic. You can build quantification out of just these primitives here, um, kind of in bulk construction. But the reason this happens in FQL is something called the topos, which is. Sorry? This is, uh, so higher logic does not have dependent types, so you don't need predicate logic. Um, I can show you how to build quantifiers out of this foundation. So quantifiers are not not predicate logic. No, it, it's predicate logic. I'll show you. You can do it. <laughs> uh, and the point, I guess, is that these constructions I showed you, products, co-products, and such, they behave in a nice way with respect to these uh, delta sigma pi migration operations. So if you want to take the sigma of product. Uh, I'm sorry, 
same amount of co-product, then you can take the co-product and the same as the and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so then in the very few amount of minutes I have remaining, I'm actually going to show uh, the tool that we've developed that does all of this stuff. And you can download it here. It has some other interesting stuff in it. So there's a translator from SQL into SQL in there. Uh, you can use it as a command line compiler, target SQL, emits RDF. And then uh, David and I are looking for collaborators to help find interesting applications of this tool. So if you like what you see, uh, get in touch and we can talk. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, so if your types are all finite, then your unit schema will be finite. If you have types that are infinite, your unit instance, sorry, your unit instance will also uh, be infinite. Uh, a little more than that, actually. You have to consider not just that, but also sort of all the ways you can trace out a path from one ID to another via one key, so it's gigantic. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. But the, the tool implements it for the finite case, so if you're interested, I can do some for you. Okay. All right, okay. So, unless there are other questions, I'll fire up this bad boy. So there was actually a, a talk at one of the uh, workshops attached to Guy basically advocated the right the right model for, for building a, a, essentially what SQL as a database is to uh, big data stuff is category theory. It reminds me a lot of what you're talking about. Yeah, but there's I a don't few. remember the title. I'm sorry. I don't remember. I'm sorry. If you mean it was a very long day that day. You don't mean Popple, right? You mean no. This is okay. Uppsala. Yeah. So there's a few different categorical approaches to modeling. Like if you know the nested relational calculus, like that came out of Kyrie Cooper did back in the day. There's a few different uh, approaches, but we seem to like it when you're dealing with foreign keys. So, uh, okay, so hopefully you're moving on from me. Yes, oh, that's not a block. Should I stop or? No, you're good. Okay, uh, so this is an employee schema very similar to what I showed Earlier? No, I can't. This is Java. <laughs> um, I might be able to zoom. Uh, I can show you offline, it, or you can download the tool now and just play along with what I'm doing if you want. Uh, it's just a Java file, a Java jar. So here's the this employee schema, similar to what I showed you before, and then an instance on that schema, sort of written out. Longhand, so you have nodes, you have the little attributes hanging off each node. In this case, they're all strings. You have some foreign keys, for example, manager takes an employee to an employee, and then you have some equations that must be obeyed by all your instances. And then here's an instance with employees 101, 102, 103. So 101 is Alan Turing. Let's use Camille Jordan. And then here are the foreign keys. So push the compile button, and then it has this nice little GUI. Visualize this thing in the graph. If you look at the instance itself, it lets you view it in this nicely joined form. Um, you can emit RDF if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, let's see, what else can this do? Um, so there's a whole bunch of uh, examples in here. So here's um, an example where you start with uh, males and females that are living in a city, and at the end of the file, you're trying to figure out who's cohabitating with whom. Uh, and so you start with some, some data here, and then you define some intermediate schemas and some mappings in between the schemas, and then you do some uh, deltas, pi's, Sigma. So in this case, we've actually combined a delta, a pi, and a sigma together. Um, but when
when you tell this thing to compile, in addition to the actual output, it's emitting SQL down here at the bottom. So you, you can go and run this on your uh, relational database if you want. And in fact, behind the scenes, they're using JDBC and calling out to the H2 database engine. And so um, we know that SQL works. <laughs> Uh, anyway, here's one of the, the initial schemas and one of the initial instances. So this thing will, it's also, there's another, like another view you can have of your data. It's sort of a graph rather than a set of tables. And here's uh, like a schema mapping from uh, this red schema to the blue schema. And then we have some other instances that we compute. This here we're getting the Simpsons. Uh, and at the end, we find out that uh, looks like Lisa, Homer, and Bart and Simpson all live here. And then Maude and Nick Rickers live here. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So there's other interesting. I don't know, I'd encourage people who are interested just to. Uh, download this thing and play around with it. And there's plenty of examples just of how uh, the data navigation operations are working. Here, I guess, is a simpler one. It's an example of that reject operation. You have a schema with uh, two nodes in the schema. The one node in the example I showed is the mapping where you take the two nodes to the one, and then you find, oh, well, if you have this instance here, then out is the projection onto two tables here. So actually, I did the examples from the talk by using this tool. Um, I'm sorry? Oh boy. Uh, so the, in general, these are not invertible. Transformations, but we have been working on the theory of view update for them. Uh, I guess the answer to your question is is no. These are one way, but um, there is some theory about how you make it actually. Sort of like delta lenses or C lens kind of. Yeah, kind of stuff like that. Constant confidence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Depends on the yeah. I guess yeah. It depends on the category whether or not those imply constant. Other questions? But the practical terms, does this allow you to sort of query the databases? Because it's data it's, uh, it's a sense function or is it also a update the database? It's, uh, it's just query. There's a, we're working on update, but this is all just query. Other questions? PL people tend to like this. Uh, database people don't like category theory, so they don't really understand it. Um, yeah, so the reception ranges from positive to bewilderment. Um, we're looking for people to help us use this, like to do something real. So if anyone here is interested by uh, collaborating, uh, you should drop me a line. something. There have been people that have been trying to use this in various ways. Somebody loaded like a gene ontology uh, into this thing. Uh, we went for a while. Um, yeah, so it's still kind of a pet project, I guess. Possibly. Other questions?